Well, good morning. Uh, just one quick announcement uh, before we before we get rolling here. Uh, on Wednesday night, October twenty first, uh, we have a uh, we have a congregational meeting that we've called. And uh, if you're a member of DEC, uh, we would like to have you there. Uh, the expectation is that you would be there for that. Uh, if you're not a member, we would love to have you anyways. You're, you're more than welcome to come. We're going to be laying out some, uh, some of the vision and, and where we feel God is calling us uh, as far as um, some of the land assets that the church owns um, and has owned uh, for some time now. And uh, the only thing is, if you're not a member, you wouldn't be able to vote on anything that we vote on that evening. But again, if you just want to come and hear uh, what's going on, you're free to interact, you're free to ask questions, anything like that. Again, the only, uh, the only thing would be you wouldn't be able to vote. Uh, that would just be for the membership. We are, for those of you that are watching at home, we are trying to work on a, uh, a Zoom option for those that still aren't comfortable being out and, and being in larger groups of people. Uh, and hopefully we'll have some more information on that uh, in the coming days as well. Well, I, uh, I don't know about you guys. I don't know how you're wired. Um, but I'm the kind of guy that, uh, the way I'm wired, I like to know if something's wrong. Like, I, I don't like, to, you know, the whole ignorance is bliss thing doesn't really, doesn't really work for me. Um, I had an opportunity this week to do something that, uh, that I haven't done in months and months and months due to, uh, due to COVID. And I had the opportunity to do a hospital visit. And uh, for months, it wasn't possible. They weren't even letting clergy into the hospitals, uh, no matter what was going on. You simply couldn't go. They weren't even letting family members in. Um, but they've relaxed that a, a little bit now. We're kind of back to the way it used to be, where even some of the restrictions, like they can only have one visitor a day, those kind of things, clergy can kind of get you around those things, and you can make, uh, you can make a hospital visit. It's definitely, it's not my favorite part of the job. Um, I'm not a huge fan of hospitals in general, unless it's a baby visit. Like if the baby, if someone's just had a baby, I will be there within 20 minutes because um, that's, that's my absolute favorite hospital visit. Uh, but it is, it's a great chance to connect and uh, just have an opportunity to talk a little bit and, and get to know some people and, and get, to know, uh, get to know some families. Uh, but as I was driving home, my mind went back to my very first hospital visit as a pastor. And uh, I was 24 years old. I've been a youth pastor for just a little while. And I remember thinking, this is a really big deal. Uh, we were going to visit a family, and it was the best kind of hospital visit. They had just had a baby. Uh, it was friends of ours that worked with our youth group with us. And so Aaron and I left after church and drove uh, about an hour south to Columbus. Uh, left our, I think we just had Ethan at that point, left him with somebody, went to go visit this family. And again, I remember thinking, look, I grew up in a pastor's home. I grew up, my dad was a pastor. I watched him, you know, do these kind of things. And I'm feeling pretty good about myself. You know, here I am. I am, I am clergy. You know, I'm, I'm going to do this officially. I'm not just visiting a friend. I am visiting as a clergy. And uh, I remember we went in and we, we visited about a half hour. I got to hold this little baby that was just a few hours old. And I think I would have remembered it anyways, because again, it was my first hospital visit. It's kind of a big deal. Uh, but there's another reason why I will never forget this visit. As we're walking out of the hospital, my wife looks over at me and goes, huh, how long has that been like that? I look down and my fly is wide open. <laughs> and not only is my fly wide open, but my dress shirt is hanging out <laughs> of my wide open fly. And immediately, I'm just, I'm, mortified. My wife thinks it's hilarious. I am absolutely mortified. And I start, you know, you first think, well, maybe no one noticed. And I start replaying things in my mind. I'm going, okay, I was standing here. They were standing. Oh, no, they noticed. <laughs> like you start, to, you start to look at where people, and then you're like, oh, man, that, that lady was laughing the whole time, and I didn't know why. And now things are starting to make a little bit more sense. And um, I, I called my friend up later that day. I just said, hey, you know, did you notice anything weird? Oh, yeah. I'm like, really? It's like, yeah, your fly was down. I'm like, well, did anyone else notice it? Oh, yeah, that's all we've talked about since you left. <laughs> and so I asked him a simple question. What do you think I asked him? Why didn't you tell me? Of course. I, why didn't you tell me? You could have taken me on the hall, and in 10 seconds, we could have fixed the whole thing. And, and avoided a whole lot of embarrassment. And, and I remember his response. I wasn't sure you'd want to know. 
what? Of course I'd want to know. If I have lettuce in my teeth or I have a stain on my shirt, my zipper's down, my tag's sticking up, my collar's not laying flat, anything like that, toilet paper stuck on the bottom of my shoe, I want to know these things. I'd like to know because I'd like to fix it. And I think your best friends are the ones that tell you and that tell you immediately that something's going on. Again, I don't, I don't believe ignorance is bliss in all situations. Well, as I've gone through these last months here, and as I've listened to both Christian and non-Christian talk about all of these issues and things that are dividing our nation right now, and as I've conversed with people on both sides of the political divide and the political fence, I don't think anyone would disagree with me that it's obvious to see that something's wrong. And I feel like as your pastor and as the leadership here at DEC, that we have a responsibility to point it out. Because look, I, I can't control what goes on out in the world. No Christian can control what's going on out in the world. But we have responsibilities as followers of Jesus Christ. And I've seen some things in the last few months that, that are concerning to me. And really what I think it comes down to, and the root of all of it is uh, our sin nature is showing. <laughs> both outside the walls of the church and inside the walls of the church. Our flesh, our humanity, those things that are ruled by our emotions and our passions. From where I stand, and, and I'm certainly as guilty as anyone at times, but from where I stand, those things are showing through. And I think that's what people are seeing right now. And it's worse than having toilet paper stuck to your shoe or lipstick on your teeth. We need to address some of these things, and we need to talk through some of these things. And it may not be, everything we talk about may not apply to everyone in here, but I think we collectively, our tendency is to allow our emotions and to allow our passions to dictate our words and our actions. But I'm seeing something that I think is a little bit more dangerous too. I'm seeing that we're allowing our emotions and our passions to dictate our interpretation of Scripture rather than allowing Scripture to speak into our thoughts and our actions and our passions and to dictate and to govern those. Because I look around these last few weeks and months and I see Christians that are, for lack of a better term, weaponizing Scripture. I see Christians that are politicizing Scripture. I see tiny portions of Scripture taken out of context to prove a point or to win an argument. And something is wrong. And, and I hope that you're wired like me. I hope that you would rather know. So that maybe if there's something that you are struggling with that we're dealing with together, that we can address it and we, we can fix it and we can begin to look more and more like what God has called us to look like. And this isn't a new problem. I think from the beginning of time, as long as there's been human life on earth, from the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, in the garden, as long as there have been societies and as long as there have been governments, there's been a struggle between the ways of this world and the ways of God. And you see in the Old Testament, uh, Israel's a case study of this. Th that idea of being called by God, being set apart by God, having to live by different standards, being held to different standards, and yet still being a part of the world and still being in the world and having to function in the world. There's that struggle, and I think that's what we're seeing in America as well. And this morning, we start a series that, to be completely honest with you, I don't want to preach. Uh, I'm not looking forward to this. I'm not looking forward to the fact that I've got to do it three times for every message. But I think it's something that all of us need to hear. And in 20 years of ministry, I've never preached directly on, uh, on politics and, and culture um, in fact, in my 44 years of life, I can only remember one pastor one time preaching a standalone message on politics. And, and I think for a lot of us, we love to keep politics out of the church. We would love to keep church and politics separate. We don't want to talk about it, at least not in church. And I get that because it's everywhere else you look. It, it's completely flooding every other area of life. And I also recognize the reality that there's a lot of potential, there's a lot of landmines as we talk through some of this stuff. And um, 
I'm going to stay a little more tied to my notes today than normal. Um, you know, I want to make sure that that what gets preached is is what the message needs to be um, and not go off on some of the rabbit trails that I can get off of on sometimes. But I know that we're going to upset some people. I know for some people, honestly, we're not going to go far enough. There's some people that think I should stand up and give a specific stance on certain things and say this is what to vote for, who to vote for, all those things. I don't believe that's my place as your pastor. And so for some, I'm not going to go far enough. Uh, For others, I'm probably going to go too far and I'm going to step on toes. But in this day and age, where our politics and our political system really are, the, the, the phrase that I keep hearing and the, the phrase that I think is pretty accurate, uh, they're nothing short of a dumpster fire. And they don't, no one seems to be concerned with the truth anymore. No one seems to be concerned really with the welfare of the people. It's more about political party than it is about things that actually matter. And I think during this time, the church needs to be reminded of who we are. And I think during this time, the church needs to be reminded of what we're called to be and the things that we're called to show. Because again, right now, I don't see a ton of difference between conversations that I hear inside the church and conversations that I hear outside the church. And so this morning, I want to establish some things that I think are going to be important as we go throughout the rest of this series. And at the end, we're going to get a little glimpse of where we're going over the course of the next weeks. But this series has already changed pretty significantly from where I thought it was going to go. This is not the message that I wanted to preach this morning or that I thought I was going to preach this morning. And I wrestled all week trying to aim it in the direction that I wanted to go. And the things that we're going to look at this morning were supposed to be four quick bullet points that just kind of set the stage, and then we were going to go off on some other things. And I just felt God saying over and over, no, stay here for a minute. These are things we need to know. And, and they're things, you know what? Honestly, they're things you've heard me preach just in the, in the short year that I've been here. But again, I feel like this is what God has for us this morning. And already we're, we're going to be a week behind. Um, the four-week series is a five-week series now, and, um, which I, I, think is gonna, I think is still going to work out just fine. So here are some truths that I want you to remember. And this gives you a little bit of, of my thought process as, as we walk through this series on Uh, trying to navigate the world in a very politically charged season. The first thing, and this, again, this is where we're going to spend a little bit more time here than than any of the others, but the first thing is that in all of this, everything we look at, everything that we talk about as Christians, we are called first to unity, and we are called to love one another. We are called to unity, and we're called to love one another. As I've looked around at everything that's going on, in this world over the course of the last six months or so, honestly, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. And it's not just because of COVID and all the things that go along with COVID and all the things that we've lost because of COVID. There's a lot of things to mourn because of what's going on over the last few months. But that's sad, but that's not why I'm heartbroken. It's not even the, it's not even the political process that we see playing out in front of us. Two sides squared off against each other each side trying to scream louder than the other side. It's not even because, again, our politicians seem to have a very loose or sometimes no relationship with the truth. They argue like little kids. It's not even because of the nation we had to sit through a presidential debate that honestly gave me flashbacks to when I was a junior high youth pastor trying to, trying to navigate conflict between two 12-year-old boys. Those are sad. But what's breaking my heart is what I see happening to relationships. What's breaking my heart, and again, I see it, it's not just happening out there. (laughs) It's what I see happening in the church, too. It's what I see happening to relationships. And I think every single person sitting here, every single person listening this morning probably has a relationship that maybe is no longer a relationship because of the politics of the last however long, you know, last political cycle, this political cycle. Or you have a relationship that's just not the same. You're not as close. You can't have the same conversations. It's hit my family hard this week where there is a huge divide between where our family lies politically and where one of my siblings lies politically to the point where um, there's a very real chance in the coming weeks that there will be no relationship left at the end of this. And that's heartbreaking. Because really... 
the important stuff are the people. Uh, the tough stuff that we're dealing with, the pandemic, the toxic political culture, those things that are dividing, those are becoming for people the most important things. And, and what I see a lot of people doing are, are scrambling to surround ourselves with people that think exactly like we do. And then putting down, mocking, even cutting off those that think differently. Now, for a non-believing world, for people that don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, for those that don't have the Holy Spirit in their life to overcome those urges of the flesh and that sin nature, for those that don't have the standard of truth, the Bible uh, to hold up to and to live up to, look, even for that, it's disturbing. But for Christians, for those that say their lives have been changed, by a relationship with Jesus Christ. For those that do have the Spirit in our life to help overcome that sin nature. For those of us that do have the Word of God that is a standard of truth that we are all held to. When I see there, there's not a lot of difference in behavior and in words and things that are being said and done between those that don't have Christ and those that do have Christ, I think as Christians we have to call it what it is. It's sin. Period. It's falling short of what God has for us and so many of the behaviors that we attack so many of the behaviors that we condemn i see that we're displaying too and the call of the church is to unity and we looked at this at length back at the beginning of the year for a couple months the call of the church is to unity not political unity but unity in Jesus. And we cannot forget that as we move through this series. You have to remember that our call is to that which unites us. Galatians 3.26. Paul is writing to a divided church in Galatia, and this is what he says. He says, You're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so what Paul does here is he says, look, here's the things that the world says should divide us. Here's the things that the world says should keep us, could, should keep us separate, should cause conflict with us. But in the kingdom of God, those things aren't what matters. What matters is that we have literally clothed ourselves with Christ. We have put on Christ. We put on the very nature of Christ, and we are united in Him. And as Christians, we are called to live in that unity, and we are called to love each other and to love our neighbors. Paul writes a little later in Galatians. He says, the entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. And then listen, because this is exactly what I see happening today. He says, if you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. As Christians, we can't lose this message in the midst of the turmoil that we find ourselves in. This is such an incredible opportunity for the church of Jesus Christ to be different and to show the world something different and to show the world something real and, and genuine. Because if we win an argument, but we lose a relationship, or if we make our point, but we push someone away from God, that's, that's pride. That's not love. A few months ago, someone sent me a link to a video, I believe it was on Facebook, of, of a, I guess, a fairly prominent pastor, I'd never heard of him before, who was taking a stand on Facebook against having to wear a mask in public. And he goes on this 12, I don't know, 12 to 15 minute Facebook rant about how he went into a Dunkin' Donuts. And it was one that he had gone into many, many times and he'd never had a problem in there before. And yet he was told this time that if he didn't put a mask on, they wouldn't serve him anymore. And I'm oversimplifying it to a degree, but he threw an absolute hissy fit. And he made thinly veiled threats. He called people names. He threatened to never go into that establishment again, which Dunkin' Donuts will probably survive that. And then on the way out, he exited in a way that he says was a big misunderstanding, but a way that could be interpreted as trying to damage their property on the way out. And then he gets in his car and he immediately goes on this rant. And he talks about how anyone that wears a mask, you're just, it's sheep, which is an argument I hear from a lot of people. You're sheep. You're terrible. You're just 
following. You're not called to do that. You're not, I don't know, the Bible calls us sheep a few times, but that's beside the point. But he even goes so far as to compare the evils of wearing a mask to the evils of abortion. And he trashes these workers, which you've been to a Dunkin' Donuts. Most of these are, you know, high schoolers, college kids just trying to make a little money. Trashes them, calls them all sorts of names, trashes the, uh, the manager and the owner of it, naming people's names. I mean, just an absolute horrific display. And I remember watching it just thinking, first of all, as a pastor, watching another pastor, just being absolutely mortified at this. But then I read the comments. And almost every comment was from a non-Christian chalking this up to another display of the hypocrisy and hatred that you find in the church. Now, did this man make a point? Yeah, he made a point. I don't think it's the point, honestly, that he wanted to make. He made a point. He got his viewpoint across. He got across what he wanted to say. But he lost any opportunity of ever being able to point any of the people that witnessed that towards a relationship with Jesus Christ. He gave people a view of God and who God is that is entirely inaccurate. And he even said during his talk, he said, well, when they first told me to put it on, I said a little prayer, and I asked God for the right words to say. And then I guarantee you what came out of his mouth next was not anything that was from God. We are called to love. We're called to live at peace whenever possible. And this guy, his, his witness is, is shot. His actions pushed people, actively pushed people away from God. How can we expect people to understand and to be able to picture a God that loves them unconditionally and loves them despite their flaws if they see Christians who aren't willing to do that exact same thing? You know, as Christians, we can disagree with people, and we will. I mean, there's a million things that I disagree with that are going on right now in this world. And there will be times where our only appropriate response is to take a moral stand, which is not what this guy was doing but we are never released from the call of god in our lives to love others and to show that love by what we say and by what we do and by how we conduct ourselves and how we handle ourselves especially in the midst of conflict or especially in the midst of trial we're to love we're to seek peace we're to stay calm really because we know no matter how chaotic this world gets no matter what it is that we're seeing around us God is in control, and if we truly believe that, that would change the mindset that we're looking at all of this with. We know God's in control. We know that God has already seen the beginning and seen the end. We know that there is nothing that is going on right now that is surprising God. God is not in heaven having to react to anything that's going on today. God's plan is and will continue to move forward, just as it has from creation. That's something that should give us peace. And it's that peace that we should be able to radiate to others. Paul writes in Romans, and really, if we could, if we could memorize this passage right here, just a few short verses, and we could live this in our lives, this would make such a huge difference. Paul writes, beginning with verse 14, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not pay anyone evil for evil, but be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Unity with the world is not always going to be a possibility for Christians, but we are always called to seek peace. And we are always called to love. We're called to do those things that we can do to show those characteristics to the world. Charles Spurgeon wrote, for us to hate those who are in error or talk of them with contempt or wish them ill or do them wrong is not according to the spirit of Christ. You cannot cast out Satan by Satan nor correct error by violence nor overcome hate by hate. The conquering weapon of the Christian is love. Like I said, this isn't the direction that I was planning 
ongoing this week. But God kept impressing it on my heart that the issues of the election that we're going to have in just a few short weeks, the people that are being elected, the platforms that are being presented, those are not the main thing. Look, those are important, absolutely. And those are things that we ought to know and we ought to be able to articulate and we ought to know where people stand on different things. But those are secondary. There's always going to be evil in this world. There's always going to be issues in this world. And if you look at the life of Christ when he was here walking on this earth, he didn't try to eradicate all of those things while he was here. But you see systematically that he tried to teach his disciples and his followers how to live in the midst of those things. Your conversations and your actions, your posture, the way that you love other people during these turbulent days will accomplish far more for the kingdom of God than your vote will. And do not misinterpret that. Do not leave here and say, Pastor Dan told us not to vote, because that is not at all what I'm saying right now. Absolutely, you should vote. Absolutely, it's important. Absolutely, it is a privilege that we have that no matter what things look like, we still ought to do. But what I'm saying is there are far more important things than your vote. Relationships and the way that you treat others. The second thing that, that I want to point out, and again, that I want you to remember as we move through uh, this series, is that our hope as Christians, our hope is not in the government. Our hope is not in the government. I think the reason that you see people being so passionate in this time, and you see the issues that are so divisive, and you see people, again, that are passionate about their, their political parties and, and their politicians, I think the reason is that because those people have placed their hope in the government. The government's going to be what fixes things for them. The government's going to pass laws that are going to make everything okay, that somehow are going to create this ideal utopia that we're all going to be able to live and and, and just everyone's going to be happy and life's going to be great there's a reason why it hasn't happened yet because it's not going to happen if your hope is placed in the government your hope is misplaced there's no such thing as a, a perfect government there's no such thing as a perfect president there's no such thing as a perfect person. There is never going to be perfection on this side of eternity. It hasn't happened since the garden. It's not going to happen until Jesus comes back for his church. Placing your hope in a political party or a government to fix what at its root is a spiritual problem will always fail you. And on the flip side of that, Descending into despair and hopelessness when the opposing party or the opposing candidate wins is really not going to get you any place either. As a follower of Jesus Christ, your hope is found in Christ alone. As a follower of Jesus Christ, your hope is found in Christ alone. And no matter how the election goes in four weeks or however long it is, nothing can change the truth that Jesus died on the cross for sinners. Nothing can change the truth that God loves you. Nothing can change the truth that for those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, we will spend an eternity in the presence of God in a very real place called heaven. Nothing can change those things. That's our hope. And that needs to be what we focus on. That needs to be what we see. It's, it's that continual call in the life of a Christian to be focused on eternity, to be focused on bigger things than just that which we see in the here and now. When everything seems to be shifting around us, we have a hope that's fixed. We have a hope that's unmoving. When each of my four kids were little, there was that that stage that I love. You know, when they're first born, they don't do a whole lot of stuff. I mean, they just kind of lay there, you know? But then when they start to make eye contact, 
And they start to make meaningful eye contact. And they know, they'll lock right in. They know mom's voice and they know dad's voice. And they will lock in and then inevitably you get that smile. You know, their whole face lights up and it's just awesome. But then just a short time later, they get to the point where they become a little bit easier to be distracted by all the things going on around them. And I remember with each of my kids, picking them up and holding them up, you know, they were old enough where their head wasn't, you know, flopping, okay, I'm a, I'm a responsible father, holding them up and trying to get them to focus on me and trying to get them to look on me, at me, and all they could do is look at everything else that was going on, you know, usually with wide head one, and I'm calling their name, and I'm smiling and making goofy faces at them, and I'm making all sorts of weird noises, and nothing I did could get them to focus on me. There was just too much else going on, too many distractions until I would bring them back down you know, and hold them tight and hold them close again where the poor kids were stuck. All they could do was look at me. For some of us, I think during this time that Jesus is desperately trying to get your attention. Jesus is trying to get you to focus on Him. And your head is on a swivel and has been on a swivel. And you're distracted by every new poll that comes out, every debate, every tweet, what this neighbor thinks, what sign is in what person's yard. And Jesus is trying to get you to turn your face back towards Him. To lock eyes with Him. To allow the background noise just to fade away and to realize again and to realize anew that He is your hope. And if your hope is placed in anything else, it will fail. It's hope that keeps us from drifting. Hebrews 6.19 says we have this hope. Talking about what it is that Jesus accomplished for us as our high priest. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. An anchor holds you in place. An anchor doesn't allow you to drift. We have this hope, our hope in Jesus Christ, to keep us from drifting. But hope accomplishes something else. Hope also frees us to look to the needs of others. Something, again, that as Christians we are called to do. The writer of Hebrews says just a little bit later in chapter 10, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Because he who has promised is faithful. I'm going to tell you, Almost every promise that I've ever seen a politician make is a lie. And they don't fulfill them. Almost every one. We serve a God who has never failed in his promises. That's where we place our hope. We place our hope in God. We place our hope in him because we know he won't fail. We know that he will follow through on what he promises to do. And when that's where our hope is, when that's where our focus is, then we're not worried about all the other stuff, all the other distractions around us, and we're able to do what we're called to do. We're able to encourage, and we're able to build into the lives of those around us. Our trust, our hope is in God. Jesus is the hope of the world. And this church that he has ordained, the local church, is the hope of of the world. This is how the gospel is going to get out. This is how people are going to come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. When they understand that He is the only place to put your hope that will not fail. These last two I'll do fairly quickly here. But the third thing that I want you to understand, please, as we're going through this series, these are not political messages. These are biblical messages. My goal over these next four weeks is not to stand up here and try to persuade you to one platform, one party, one voting position, or the other. It's not to tell you how you should vote or why you should do it. My heart and my desire is to give you biblical principles that will govern how we interact with other people during this time. To give you biblical principles that absolutely will speak to and inform how we make political decisions. But here's the reality, and we're going to hit on this at length uh, a little bit later, next week, most likely, unless, unless we go a different direction again. Most likely next week. But there are huge glaring flaws in both parties that, that serve this country. 
There is no such thing as a political party. There's glaring flaws, there's issues, there's sin issues on both sides, and there are glimmers of truth on both sides. And so if we, if we try to address things these next four weeks from a purely political standpoint, if we try to interpret the truth of Scripture through the lens of this broken political system, we're going to end up with a mess. We're going to end up with nothing but confusion. And so here's what I want to ask of you in these coming weeks. Whatever you hear preached from this pulpit, interpret it through the merits of Scripture. Interpret it through the lens of Scripture. Look, if I say something that you don't believe lines up with God's Word, absolutely call me on it. Okay? Not in the middle of the service. Like Maybe, maybe wait till afterwards. But call me on it. Now, if I say something you don't agree with politically, I'm asking you to interpret these through the lens of Scripture. These are biblical messages, not political messages. 2 Timothy tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture is useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness, so the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All Scripture is God-breathed. This is God's Word to us. This is God's Word for how we should uh, relate to people, how we should interact with the world around us. Scripture will guide us. Scripture will inform our decisions. Not political party, not political platform, not political agenda. It's Scripture that's going to equip us to be light in this dark world. And the last thing is that we will show grace. This goes hand in hand with the first one. Unity, love. We're going to show grace. I'm asking you to show me grace during these next few weeks. Again, we don't have time to cover everything that I think some people would like to see covered. And we don't have time to do it at a depth that some people would like to see us dive into. There are some things we're going to stay up, you know, the 10,000 foot view. And we're not going to dig into. Because my goal, again, is to look at the biblical principles behind these things. That govern our thoughts, that govern our behaviors. Not to cover every topic, not to cover every scenario. And that being said, I am happy to talk to anyone at any time. I'm happy to talk with you about something you disagree with. I'm happy to talk with you about something you agree with. I'm happy to talk. I'd rather do that one, but I think most of us would. But either way, I'm happy to talk with you about something you just want more clarification. If something that I said makes absolutely no sense and you want to talk about it, I'm happy to do that, and I will do my best to make time for each and every person that wants to discuss something further in the coming weeks. Now, please don't misinterpret this. I have no interest in your angry emails and texts. None. And to be perfectly honest with you, I probably will not answer them over the course of the next few weeks. Because I think something that is as polarizing as what we're going to be looking at, something that is as potentially divisive as what we're going to be looking at, I don't think we can have a conversation through digital media. Because you can't read my tone You can't see my body language. And really, when you do it by text, when you do it by emails, there's very little accountability. I do it. I know the rest of you do. I will say things to someone if I don't have to look them in the eye that I would never say to their face. And so if you want to talk, please get a hold of me. Most of you at this point have my cell phone number. If you don't, ask for me after the service, and I'll give it to you. I will do my best to make time for everyone. I will even buy coffee, all right? Just not at the works. Because that's the worst coffee in the world, right? Anyway, hopefully that's the only opinion that I'm going to give during these weeks, but I don't even think that's opinion. That's just truth. Um, <laughs> we, can, we can meet at breaking new grounds. Happy to do that. But where there are disagreements, whether it's with me, whether it's with your spouse when you go home and you start talking about some of this stuff, whether it's with someone else in the church, whether it's with a neighbor, whoever it is, please show grace. Again, there's a lot of potential landmines and pitfalls in any discussion about culture and politics. And so as we move ahead, that's what I'm asking of you. Please show grace. So these are the ground rules. This is kind of the foundation of where we're going to go. And I want you to turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Matthew chapter 6. It's going to be up on the screen as well. And I just want to give you a quick look at where we're going. Kind of whet your appetite for the weeks that are coming. 
Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 25, and I am reading from the New Living, if it sounds a little bit different than what you're reading from. Jesus is speaking. It says, That's why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't they far more valuable to him, or aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. This is where we're going to dive in next week. And this is what I really want you to hold on to in the coming weeks. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. This is how we're to approach everything. What does God want? What's the right way to act in this moment? Here it is right here. This is the big idea for this entire series. As Christians, our allegiance is to something and someone greater than this world. We are to be kingdom-minded, kingdom-first people. And next week we're going to get into what that looks like. And then in the weeks that follow, we're going to spend a week looking again at our call to unity and diving in on some of the writings of Paul when it comes to uh, that call for the church and out in our community as well, how that's possible in a time of dissenting ideas and opinions. Then we're going to spend a week looking at what God has to say about human government. Scripture's not silent on the idea of government. Scripture's not silent on the idea of leaders that are placed above us. And then finally, that last week, we're going to wrap things up by looking at the responsibility and the call on the life of a Christian to pray for those who lead us. Uh, Whether you agree with them, whether you like them, uh, we are called to pray, and we are called to bring them before the throne of God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the unchanging truth of your word. We thank you that in times like these, as, as everything else seems to be changing and everything else seems to be shifting, that as Christians we can continue to stand on the absolute truth of the Bible. Lord, I pray in these coming days, I pray that your Spirit would move in our hearts and in our lives, that we would move from that place of wanting to argue about everything and move from that place of wanting to prove our points to win, that you would bring us to that place where our desire is to be unified. Where our desire is to look at the people around us and to find those things that we have in common. And here in this place, in this church, that we would understand that the fact that we are united in Christ outweighs anything that could divide. Lord, help us in these days to love We have an incredible responsibility when we look at the world around us and we see hate and we see division. Lord, change our hearts. When people see us, when people see the church, when people see your followers, I pray that they would see unity and love. I pray that they would see a people who value relationship, a people who believe with all of our hearts that each and every one is created in your image treat them as such. Lord, remind us again of where our hope is placed. Remind us again that our hope is in you and you alone. Father, I pray that you will do a work in this place. I pray that rather than this be a series that pushes people apart and divides, that there would be a revival in this place, an awakening, a return to the simplicity of the gospel. We 
pray this in your name.